I think philosophy is the most powerful and important intellectual discipline that humans can engage in. I think every other discipline relies on philosophy. Like, if you just dig three centimeters under any other discipline, you get to philosophy. That is, to questions that the people in those disciplines don't know how to engage with. So they're making philosophical assumptions that they don't know how to justify. And that's true about every other discipline other than philosophy. So we are at the foundation of everything. So this is a very old-fashioned, traditional view of philosophy. Welcome everyone to today's interview, where I'm very pleased to welcome Professor Herman Kepelin. He is Chair of Professor of Philosophy at the University of Hong Kong. His work has focused on a range of topics, including semantics, philosophy of mind, political philosophy, uh, and artificial intelligence. His books include Insensitive Semantics with Ernest Lepore, Philosophy Without Intuitions, Fixing Language, an Essay on Conceptual Engineering, Bad Language with Josh Dever, uh, and several others, uh, including his most recent book, I think it's his most recent book, um, Making AI Intelligible, Philosophical Foundations, also with uh, Josh Stever. He also has a variety of published articles. Um, feel free to add anything, but with that, welcome and uh, thanks so much for being here, Professor Keppel. Uh, thanks, for, thanks for having me. Great. So, yeah, what I um, read in preparation and, and wanted to focus the interview on today was uh, your book from 2018 titled, uh, as I said in the introduction, Fixing Language, uh, an Essay on Conceptual Engineering. Um, that's available from Oxford University Press and can be found on Amazon. I'll include some links uh, in the description. But anyway, I, I have to say I did really enjoy the read and uh, I found the topic quite fascinating. Um, and so as a brief introduction for the audience, do you mind kind of describing what your general project in that book was and and what conceptual engineering is, I guess, broadly, roughly. Yeah, the, the goal of the book was really to try to collect together a variety of work that had some commonality, but I don't think that it was pursued in a way that emphasized uh, that commonality. And the, the different parts of philosophy that I wanted to collect together all had one thing in common, that they were critical to the conceptual repertoire that we have, or some subset of that repertoire. They try to assess our vocabulary or, or conceptual resources, and then they try to think of sort of ways to improve it. So that, that took place in many areas. It goes, for example, back to Carnap when he was talking about explication as an essential part of scientific inquiry. Carnap's idea was that ordinary language wasn't very good for scientific reasoning. And so uh, what scientists and theorists, other theorists should do would be to, to sharpen and make theoretically useful ordinary language terminology. But that tradition is often seen, for example, as very separate from what people were doing in feminist philosophy. But here's an interesting thing. In a lot of the literature on on feminism and race theory, some of the same type of work was going on. If people were thinking about the conceptual repertoire, we have for thinking about the gender and race, for example, and criticizing it and proposing ways to improve it. Well, they looked very different because one was focused on a scientific enterprise, one was focused more on social political. But they were, in a way, at least this was the proposal in the book, there's something to be said for thinking of them as a unified project, as a group of philosophers whose goal it was to assess our conceptual repertoire, to try to find defects. If you found defects, try to figure out ways to make it better. If you find ways to make it better, then think of ways to actually implement those 
ameliorative proposals. Now, if you're if you're into that type of philosophy, you can you can do it in two ways. And the way people had been doing it was very specific. It was like the uh, the gender study people were interested in terminology used for talking about gender, race, about race, people in legal theory about legal terminology, uh, psychiatry about psychiatry, science about science. So they didn't really see that that much in common. And what I was trying to say was, look, the whole idea that a concept could be deficient, that it could have defects, that's a general type of claim. Let's try to systematize the different kinds of defects there could be. Then the idea that we could improve it, that there would be such a thing as amelioration, that's a general type of claim. Let's try to systematize the different ways in which something could be improved. And finally, let's try to say something more general about how proposals for ameliorations could be implemented. And so I think people who are engaged in that general project face interesting common theoretical challenges. And the book is a sort of meta reflection on that type of project and an effort to systematize the issues that are become salient once you, you see that bigger picture. It's also an effort to propose a particular theory. And the particular theory I I, I call the austerity framework, but in a way, I care a little bit less about the proposal, though it's driving the narrative throughout the book in some ways. But I think if people just get into that way of thinking in very big terms about the nature of conceptual engineering or what some people call conceptual ethics, that would be awesome. And I, yeah, got to say, I think I don't really know any part of philosophy where so much work has come so quickly. I'm definitely not just because of this book, but but somehow after that book, um, there's literally hundreds and hundreds of papers now devoted to that type of, uh, of theorizing that I just described. Yeah, yeah, very good. Um, like as you say, it's not it's not a very new idea. I mean, it's gone back at least to um, some of those names that you've mentioned, like Carnap. Probably much earlier than that too, but um, perhaps it just hasn't got gotten a lot of the intention that it's deserved in the past, I suppose. And now it's just like a big, a big topic. Um, a little bit about, about the past. Um, there is a sense in which, in the past, people were even more deeply involved in these issues than we are now. And I think actually the weird part of history is that little second half of the 20th century. I mean, the beginning of what we often think of as analytic philosophy was dominated by Frege, Russell, Carnap. Now, they they were incredibly critical of the language we have. In early Wittgenstein, Frege's Begriff Schrift, Carnap, was think you know, had this view that a lot of what we were saying was just nonsense, and he had a proposal for how to make it better. So this whole idea that you would start out assessing language, try to make it better, I think that was just what motivated the, the originators of analytic philosophy. And then I think what was sort of weird that happened was that as linguistics developed in the second half of the 20th century, philosophers took this more descriptive thought where they got incredibly interested in little details about how the word the works or if and they and, and they just thought that the only thing they should be doing is describing those structures so I took this non-normative term but my own you know my first of all the historical sense is like that's that's gonna fade quickly it's not going to be an important part of the history of philosophy the normative tradition, will will dominate and it has dominated and that little descriptive period is just going to look weird right good i mean you might be interested in some of those descriptive facts and maybe there's some use to, to thinking and understanding them but as you suggest maybe it's, it's going to be less important for well um what we're going to do now how things are going to evolve in the future and so on um language wise well, well, 
I, just a little bit because I'm so, somewhat interested in that. I think, I think there is a generation of philosophers, and I, I, in a way, was part of that generation. I wrote my whole dissertation on how quotation works, which now seems really weird just to get like exactly how quotation works. Um, I think what we've seen now, more and more, is that the training that philosophers have and the kinds of connections that we philosophers need to have to the rest of the discipline isn't very well served by philosophers of language tying themselves very tightly to the descriptive part of linguistics. First of all, because the linguists are just better at it than us. Because they learn syntax and phonology and the different languages, and so they have a training that we don't have. So you'd have to do all that on the side. And just in terms of division of labor, it makes more sense to have the people who do a PhD in linguistics do that than to have those of us who are trained also in Aristotle and free will and moral philosophy. It doesn't, it just, there's going to be a kind of amateurishness eventually compared to the linguists in doing it. And I think that's becoming increasingly salient. The other thing is that that descriptive tradition is in danger. It's already fundamentally in danger of alienating the rest of philosophy. Because when the philosophy of language used to be this exciting part of philosophy that would attract all the other sub parts of philosophy to it, it would play a big role in, in moral philosophy, big role in philosophy of mind, and so on. But when you start re writing very detailed things that it ties up to syntax and semantics and different languages and so on, that connection is just lost and also it becomes impossible for the rest of the philosophers to engage with it. So I think as a result of that, you're seeing a decline in the interest in philosophy language. And if it ties itself too closely to that descriptive tradition, it it will be incredibly marginalized. It will be sort of at the same level as philosophy of biology or philosophy of quantum physics. Not unimportant. Someone should be doing it. But it will definitely lose the sort of salience and centrality that it has had. And that I think if, if we make this normative turn, it can still have. Right. Good. So, um, I mean, I think this is what I'm about to say is something you would more, more or less agree with, but this was my thought on, um, sort of motivation for conceptual engineering. Um, you know, we find ourselves using language, having the sort of thoughts that we have. Um, but we also have various goals, um, some to do with communication, some to do with inquiry, um, practical goal goals, um, social goals, etc. And sometimes how we use language or the, like what sort of thoughts that we have um, can be relevant to, you know, the realization of those goals. And in those cases, it can make, you know, practical sense to try to shift our language and thought to uh, so that they help satisfy those goals. Um, but that just seems to be a motivation for conceptual engineering. Is that... Um, Roughly how you'd put it, does that make sense to you? Yes, exactly. Look, it's a somewhat uh, overused analogy, but it does seem sensible, at least for some purposes, to think of our language as a kind of tool, a tool that serves many different kinds of purposes. One is to communicate with others, one to coordinate action, to articulate our thoughts, and so on and so forth. And if you start thinking like that, and it just seems completely obvious that tools humans have made in this weird historical way that language has developed won't always be as good as it could be for the purposes that we're putting it to. So a language that has evolved in a setting where there wasn't much science, for example, wouldn't be ideal for engaging in the scientific enterprise, a language that has developed uh, for hunters and gatherers surviving in under harsh circumstances wouldn't be ideal for thinking about the hardest questions in metaphysics. It wasn't really made for that. So in all that and many other settings, we'll 
just think, oh, we made this thing. No one really thought of how to do it. It just happened to this very complicated, hard to understand, hard to track historical process. And it didn't end up ideal. But it's pretty, we're getting along reasonably well, but yeah, we can do better. And the thought that we couldn't possibly do better just seems incoherent to me. And so as soon as you think we could do better, then you think, well, then we probably should do better. So let's think about how to improve it. Or you could say, look, we can't possibly manage to make it better. Let's let it just evolve on its own. Uh, that's a somewhat defeatist attitude. I mean, I'm, there's elements of parts of me that sympathize sympathetic towards it, but, but the, the initial idea I think should be, look, we've got this really important tool. It shapes our cognitive lives or communicative lives. It helps us engage with other human beings. So then, since there seems to be this potential for making it better, uh, give it a shot. Yeah, good. And we'll, we'll turn to some of those, um, those issues in, in, in a bit. Um, so yeah, so the book, well, the book title and the parent topic of it is conceptual engineering. Um, in a way your approach both doesn't really involve concepts. And doesn't really involve a whole lot of engineering either. Um, so, I mean, on the on the first part, then, um, why do you largely avoid talk of concepts? And I mean, what is the book really about then, um, without without concepts? So there is a way of using the term concept where, in ordinary language, is it's a it's a term we use for whatever it is that enables our cognitive lives to function the way it does when we form beliefs and express thoughts and then it's the sort of thing that underlies linguistic meaning in a super loose sense and so that's that was the colloquial sense of conceptual engineering that i'm, I'm using and then there's a whole bunch of theories about what these things, concepts are, going back to Frege, through those different uses in psychology, through different uses in all kinds of different disciplines. Now, that whole history of use of concepts is, I think, a mess. There are just too many of them. None of those theories are particularly attractive. I don't want to use the term concept to pick out one of those theoretical categories. You know, the one that Frege had or the one that some people in some parts of psychology or some other parts of psychology or whatever it is. There's, there's so many ways people use that term. Now, when I wrote the book, I didn't want to want it, it to depend on a particular theory like that. And so, so even though I thought the term conceptual engineering would give people a sense of what it was about. And also, you know, I'm not, I think. If people have a particular theory of con concepts, they can plug it in. Because as I said, I wanted the book to be this space for people to play around with their own theories. And so the thought was uh, sneak people in, get them in the door by using this, I think, ultimately defective terminology. And as soon as they're in, I'm going to slam the door after them so they can't get out again. And then I'm going to start talking about something else. And so what the other thing I talk about, which shouldn't be particularly worrisome or controversial to anyone, are words. Because I think everyone agrees we have words. And the words have meanings. There's disagreement about what those things are, meanings, or whether they are things, or what sort of status they have. But most people very large majority of people thinking about it at least think that they have extensions. They pick out things in the world. So table will pick out the things that are table. That's one of its functions. The things that could have been tables and so on. And so I try to, to retreat to these more non-controversial entities, entities that are not as theoretically loaded as uh, concepts. So that was the reason. So, so the... the um, Calling it conceptual engineering was an advertising trick. And then when people like take the hook, take the bait, then I tell them, hey, I'm not going to really talk about that at all because I, I don't really believe in that. But I'll give you something that's much nicer, much cleaner words. 
Now, it turns out, I, I'm, I didn't talk about this in the book, but I did write my dissertation also on the metaphysics of words. And I don't really believe in words either, but I'm going to put that aside for now. So that was the, and, and you know, I think you know, there's a bunch of different terminology around that people use for the project that I call conceptual engineering. I've uh, co-edited a volume with Alexei Burgess and David Plunkett, and they like to use this term conceptual ethics. There's a lot that has going for it, I think. So was, the way they think about it is the ethics of how we use concepts or the the, the, the normative properties of concept use and concept change, something like that. Um, but I'm a bit worried about that terminology because it sounds like you're doing ethics, but in a conceptual way. So, and also, I think the considerations, when I said that we assess concepts, think about how to make it better, it wasn't really in this, the thing that I associate with ethics in a way. So, so that's why I didn't want to use that. And when, um, when we were editing my volume together, we were so much in disagreement about terminology, which is funny because it's a book about terminology or maybe predictable, that we almost couldn't publish it. So we ended up just calling it conceptual engineering and conceptual ethics. And then in the introduction, David wrote one thing about what he thought conceptual ethics was, and I wrote what I think conceptual engineering is. Good, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I was thinking that, you know, talk of conceptual engineering, that's a bit more catchy than, you know, I don't know, the evolution of our representational devices or something like that. Um, yeah. Um, all right, so yeah, so getting into some of the... Um, the the meat of your approach um well one one thing that you accept and, and discuss at some length is um semantic externalism um for the audience briefly i, I understand that as a thesis that um the meanings or or the contents of at least some of a person's uh thoughts or beliefs are or utterances are determined at least in part by things external to that person's mind uh, more to their accessible psychological features, intentions, attitudes. Um, so, yeah. So, how, how is this um, important in your approach here on, on conceptual engineering? Um, uh, and 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 to what extent do you think someone less sympathetic to externalism or your sort of externalism um, could make use of your um, approach here? Okay, let me just sort of break that up into three parts real quickly. Like, what, why is it important? What's the externalism? And what can you do if you don't like externalism? So the reason it's important, because I said, I don't, when I, when I uh, use this advertisement of saying we're going to do conceptual sharing, you, you take the bait, you come in, and I throw away the concept part, and I say, well, look, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to talk about words and their meanings. Now you can say, hey, what do you mean by meanings? What kind of things are those? That's going to be... Because what we're now doing is we're, in a way, assessing a concept. Let, just to make things very precise, let's let's think of one, one of the examples that I, I like from um, David Plunkett and Tim Sandel is they have this discussion of the term torture, where there's a long public disagreement about what it should include. For example, waterboarding. Is that a form of torture? U.S. government had a ruling and different reports saying, no, that's not torture. And other people said, well, it is a form of torture. So there's a disagreement of what its meaning is. And one way to think about that is where should it, what should it mean? Should it mean something such that waterboarding is torture or should it not? Another instance of this is the term person. So in the original Roe v. Wade ruling of the Supreme Court, that was an incredibly explicit there was, it was just sort of playing into the hands of this project. They said, look, it all depends on what the word person means. If a fetus is a person, then of course abortion should be banned because we're not allowed to kill people. If it isn't, uh, it at least opens the door. So, so these dis disagreements about the meanings are, uh, on my picture, you've got the word, person, torture, the meanings, and there's assessment or disagreements about what those meanings are. 
Uh, and you can think, look, meaning of torture that doesn't include waterboarding seems like a bad meaning because waterboarding is similar to all these other things you call torture. It just seems completely random to pick that out. And when we know the history of what, why you would exclude it, it also seems random. And that kind of randomness isn't very good. And then with respect to person, I guess everyone knows the different arguments on each, each side. It's like complicated. So, okay, so we need something that is plays the role of the meaning of a term in order to get this project off the ground because we're assessing the meaning. And that's where the externalism comes in. Okay, so the first thought, so now I think, I hope that clarifies why it's important because because we don't have concepts, we have these things meaning, so we're going to assess them. And the externalist picture is one in which meanings are the objects, think of it very simply as it's the objects denoted in the world. Technical terminology, the extension, the things that it applies to. So tables is just the set, at least one thing it is, is the set of tables in the world. The things that are tables. The extension of torture would be all those events that would constitute torture. So it's a connection between a, a term and, and all the things in the world that it applies to. And it can make it more complicated by talking about possibilities and stuff. Okay, so now the question is, how do we get that connection from the word to those things in, in the world, the things that are tables or that are torture, that are persons? And there are two kinds of rough theories developed over the last 50, 60 years. One is the externalist view that I like. It's often associated with authors like Saul Kripke, Hilary Putnam, Tyler Birch, Ruth Milliken, and so others in that tradition. And on this view, the connection between a word and the world is created through historical and social factors of various kinds. So we could talk in more detail about both those historical and social, but what's really important about it is that it, it's not the speaker, him or herself, that's making the connection. It's, it's, a, it's the embeddedness of that expression in a larger historical and social context. So it's external to the individual speaker. That's the form of externalism. That's, that's why it's externalism. So I don't decide right now when I use the word table, what table, what, what sort of things table apply to in English. I don't have that power. It's something that happened throughout a long history of semantic linguistic evolution. Um, and then there are different theories about just how we should think of those social and historical factors, but we don't need to, to go into that in order to contrast, contrast it with the internalist picture, the internalist picture is one where whatever I mean by table depends on what I think tables are. It's not anything that you do or anyone else is doing anywhere, not about the past, not about anything like that. It's something that I have control over internally. And so the internalist says meanings in some sense are in the head, in determined by the individual speaker at some level or another. What I mean by table is determined by some state of mind. And the externalist says, no, even if you knew everything about me when I speak, you wouldn't know what sort of things in the world my words apply to, because that's determined by something external to me. So that's the answer to the second part of that one question. That's the externalist-internalist distinction. And in the book, I illustrate conceptual engineering from the point of view of externalism, because that's the view that I believe in. But as I said uh, in the introductory remarks, I don't really want the book to be, I want the book to be an advertisement for the topic, not for a particular theory. And so I think it's great if people who have completely different views of meaning go ahead and articulate how they think conceptual engineering would happen on their views of what meaning is, what the connection is between language and the world. Uh, so, in answer to your question, the, the, of course, the externalist who wants to make a proposal 
I'll first say first say a little bit about what they have in common. Okay, so so you were saying, well, how does it look different if the if you're an internalist? But let's first look at at what they have in common. So the internalist and externalist who look at the term, say, torture, and they think, well, should it mean something that includes waterboarding or not? That's actually a quite that's an issue they can both care about. And they can both think that it should or it shouldn't, and they can disagree. That's so far so good. And the arguments for why it should, suppose you thought the argument for why it should be included, that waterboarding should be a form of torture. Suppose you thought the argument was, well, it's very, very similar to all the other things you call torture. And so it looks random and ad hoc to not include it, just for simplicity, suppose that was. That's an argument they could agree on too. So... So those that first assessment stage is one they could agree on. And then even on how to improve, so, so, well, it, the best notion of torture is one, and then they could agree on what that is. It includes waterboard, it includes this and that. They could have like, this commonality at that level. Now, the point where they will disagree is when it comes to how to change that. So suppose you've, you're sort of on board, you say, well, we want to change the meaning of this expression. And the externalist and the internalist uh, are, have joint forces. They have the same arguments for why it's bad the way it is. They think about the, how to improve it the same way. But now they're going to try to implement those changes. They're going to be kind of like linguistic activists. That's the point, the most obvious point, at which their, their paths will diverge quite radically. So the internalist will look inwards and think, Oh, it's up to me. I have to change the meaning because meaning depends, according to the internalist, on me. Let's say, things inside of me you know, fill in the details, different ways of doing that. And so the internalist will be like introspecting and doing like their little internal manipulations, whatever that might be. And then the externalist will be, oh, I got to change these historical social things. That looks really hard, but, you know, whatever it is, like, I can do would have to be external to me. It's not something that I don't have control over. So, so they have these very different implementation uh, issues and strategies, but a lot in common prior to that. Was that helpful? Did that answer your question? No. Yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> um, yeah. A lot of a lot of good stuff there. Um, just on the uh, dispute there between the internalist and externalist. Um, one thing you mentioned was that, look, uh, on the externalist view, you're not going to be able to read off um, or infer from just psychological features um, what it is that uh, you might, the person might be referring to or might fall under the extension of, of their concept or term. Um, and, well, to some extent, I, I would think that that's consistent with internalism. Um, so for example, I want to be able to make, uh, say that an internalist could make use of say indexical expressions, um, demonstrative reference, uh, semantic deference and so on, um, where you won't be able to infer like all the features of something which they're talking about as, um, but nevertheless, the meaning of their expression is something internal, um. Not giving a full explanation here, but um, I guess the thought is that internalists don't have to commit to look all the facts about the referent follow from the kind of psychological features they have in mind when they're referring. To, uh, does that make sense? No, there. You're right. There are many. I was kind of caricaturizing the two positions. So, so after forty, fifty years of debate, there's there are a number of intermediate positions in a, 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 of many kinds. So I was, I was trying to sort of starkly contrast the two, uh, the two positions. You're, you're definitely right that on even the most ardent internalists, when it comes to indexicals, there's going to be things that are external to the individual doing some of the determination. It's just the, I guess one way to think of at least the version of it is as a kind of supervenience thesis. You you can't get a change in the referent without a change in the individual, um, and uh, 
and you might think, well, for index, for terms that are context sensitive, like here and now and so on, that's going to be a difficulty for the for the internalist because you think, well, you can keep the individual the same, but just like move him or her to a different location, and here will suddenly mean something else. Um, so that's a standard difficulty for the internalist who wants to be really hardcore about the determination relation as a supervenience relation. But different ways to go, but that would take us into the various rabbit holes of, of uh, how to defend the, or articulate internalism. I'm happy to, to go there, but as I said, it's not the view that I'm appealing to in the book. So I'm, I'm um, I don't know, like I don't know, I don't have that many firmly held beliefs in philosophy. I feel I feel like what we're doing is so hard that any strong conviction is kind of laughably absurd. But I do feel pretty strong, maybe strongest about externalism of any view that I've ever encountered. So I'm I'm so deeply in an externalist tradition. And for me, these internalist views are just, they're not, I'm not even like explore those rabbit holes anymore. I'm all done with that. But I'm happy to talk about them if you want to. Yeah, I mean, it's not um, super central, this sort of dispute to the this, um, to the book, but a bunch, bunch, bunch of other things I want to get to. I will say kind of briefly, uh, I definitely used to be a more kind of committed internalist on these things. Um, nowadays I've softened a bit in that, well, you mentioned this already, um, what I say, I guess might turn on what exactly we're trying to capture with a theory of meaning, what really is meaning, what's the meaning of meaning so Um, you said something about, well, it's a, it's has something to do with the connection between a word or something else and the thing in the world for which it stands or, or the extension and so on, the reference. But um, what exactly is the, the, the thing that is we're talking about? Um, that can be a bit unclear, and maybe people can have different things in mind. So perhaps I want to capture certain psychological features that are relevant to psychological explanation, like deliberation um, and action and so on. Or maybe we want to capture more facts, maybe all the facts that go into um, sort of determining the um, extension of a of a term, and that could include external um, indexical facts, you know, facts about the the use of other uh, um, the other speakers and historical facts, correlations that have developed. I, who knows what else might be might be relevant there? Um, so, what and in short, what you're trying to capture there in a theory of meaning, or what meaning is supposed to be, is going to um, can be a bit unclear, and, and make, getting clearer on that can help to to resolve the dispute for me, I guess. Yeah, 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 all right. That's that's part of what this debate has been about. What exactly are we trying to explain, and what's the domain of what needs to be explained? My own sense, again, this is going to take us quite a bit of way from conceptual engineering, is that even if you're focusing on psychological explanations or behavior action and so on. Uh, it's anything that's worthy of the name internalism isn't going to do that explanatory work uh, either. But but uh, yeah, that would... Yeah, so I wrote, I wrote a book with Josh Dever called The Inessential Indexical, and we spent a lot of time there talking about these issues. Uh, we have a few papers talking about the connection between mental states and actions and different ways of thinking about the connection between content and agency which is, is one of the big topics in that in that work so but i like so i agree with you those those are really relevant and important topics to be to be bringing up if you want if you're coming to this internalism externalism debate from scratch uh so but i i was just to go back to fixing language where I, I love writing books because you get to paint like this big canvas and you get to create your own terminology and structure the whole thing the way you want to um, compared to 
articles where you're, you're just sort of restricted to basically like picking up on other people's stuff and a- answering questions that are familiar already because you, you can't do all the groundwork. But one of the problems with books is it's so wide open that they end up sometimes just being too big. So, so there's a kind of brutality that goes into creating the framework when you have such an open-ended uh, structure. And so one of the things I did in that book was say, look, I'm just not going to talk about these issues here because that would be a different book. I've written a lot about it, but right here, I'm just going to go plug in a theory and it's like a proof of concept. So lots of people have views sort of in this neighborhood. If you do, here's a bunch of really cool issues for you to think about and play around with. And then, you know, this goes back to your previous question. And it's like, like if you're an internalized, plug in your thing here and start playing around with it and see how you would, would structure this, this research field. And it's cool. Like lots of people have done that. No. Nah. So there's, it's not, so yeah. So I wasn't, I don't know, so, some, I think I've written 10 books or something. And in a lot of those books, I'm really, you know, like I'm, I'm very hardcore defending a particular thesis. And, and I spent a lot of time just refuting all the alternatives. This book just isn't like that. So I was trying to be like this, like very open, generous, uh, here's a playground. Here's a little sandbox. Anyone can bring their own toys in and play around with it. The only thing I insist is that you find the, the sandbox fun and entertaining and useful. Yeah, good. I, I, I like that. Um, that thought. So I guess we can move on and discuss some of the other things that kind of follow in, in, in the book. So one thing that you, um, um, one, one feature of conceptual engineering, uh, just to keep using that phrase, um, that you argue for is, uh, what you call lack of control. Um, so the, the basic idea is that the process of conceptual engineering is, um, typically and to a large extent outside of our control. Um, we can't like intentionally influence how, how it proceeds. Um, but I was thinking, I mean, this isn't super clear. I mean, maybe this is going to come back to the, the internalism, externalism stuff, but I don't know. I, I was feeling that if I wanted to, I could just start using the term woman in, for example, in the way that Hasslinger proposed, um, I could start applying it in those cases judging it to be an, an apt application where, you know, that definition says it is and so on. Uh, I mean, this might not necessarily lead to a broader change in term use, but as far as myself goes, it seems like easy enough. Um, I don't know. I don't know. What do you think about this and the, and the lack of control stuff, broadly? I guess, so let me st- step back a little bit. Uh, even from the conceptual engineering project. So this thing that people who do philosophy are doing, the kind of reflection we engage in, strike many of us, and I'm one of those people, as one of the most fundamental and interesting and important type of intellectual activity that any human can possibly engage in. Uh, But it does have for some people, uh, a limitation built into it. It feels like we're not really doing much in the world if you have a somewhat restricted sense of doing. I mean, we're finding possible answers, sometimes maybe the right answers, sometimes good arguments. But if your goal is to change the world in various ways, it might not be the most efficient way to go about doing that. That's a general fact about philosophy. Now, it's pretty salient, actually, in certain areas, like like the feminist theory, gender theory, and so on. The people who are engaged in that are very often also interested in us thinking of philosophy as a certain form of activism. So they're thinking that the, the reflective work, the theoretical work, should have a, a connection to, to practical, political consequences. Uh, I don't share that. I, I'm 
I think it would be great if that was true, but I'm very skeptical in general of any such connection. And I think that if that's the reason you went in, your life work is potentially going to disappoint you a lot if that's the measure by which you assess its success. Okay, so that's the, the general attitude. Now, the impl particular implementation of that is in the area of conceptual engineering. You've got some criticism of a concept. You've got a proposal that you're absolutely convinced of for how to make it better. And then it's very tempting to think, well, I figured out how to make this thing better, so now I have to do it, make it better. Just an analogy on this before we sort of move to the particular question you had. It, it's a little similar to people who work in moral and political philosophy. They, they might have a theory about what's good, how the world should be, how society should be organized. They've been thinking about how it actually is, and they think, well, we can do much better, and boom, here is the better thing, okay? Now, of course, for those people, too, it seems tempting maybe to think, well, now I should go to the next step, and I should try to make the world, you know, if you're Chomsky, I should try to implement anar anarchism in some way, or this or that theory that you're convinced of. And so that, that temptation, I think, is probably often there when you have a, a normative... Okay, so in, in conceptual engineering, you've got this word, and you have a theory of how it should, its meaning should be revised. Okay, so this is where we get to your question. So as I said earlier, I think the meaning of a term in English is determined by historical and social facts and hundreds of years of speech, mil billions of people speaking it. They speak patterns in ways that we really don't understand. No one has any clue how those meaning changes happen. And it seems to follow pretty immediately from that, that if your goal is to change the meaning in English of a term, you or I have absolutely no way of doing that. And we could, we could sort of whisper in a, a little bit into the air, but no, that's not going to have any effect on anything the probability that anything you or I or anyone else or any of our friends or even a group of us is doing should have any effect is absolutely minimal. We have very little control of it. So that's the thesis of little control. So, and it's it's a, not exactly corollary, but, but a neighborhood view of the externalist thesis. So it goes kind of hand in hand with the view that these meaning determining facts are so far outside of my control that meaning change is also outside of my control because I'd have to change those underlying facts. That was not, that was the thesis of lack of control. And then you were saying, okay, well, what about me just wanting to use the term in a new way? I could just, you know, start thinking that I want, so here, here for example, is a cop, and there is this English word cop, and maybe I could, let's, let's think that we really shouldn't have something that's, just for cops, it should include bottles as well. So I'm going to start using the word cop so that it implies to this thing and to bottles. Um, well, it's already... <laughs> ...follows from what I said, that if your goal is to change the meaning of the word in English, that's not going to work. You thinking that isn't going to do that work. Now, what is true is that you might get some people to realize that when you say cop, you mean cup or bottle. That could work. It would be a few people, a few people who remember you, but they, that you made that stipulation. But there isn't a notion uh, of the meaning of this word in a natural language such that that fact would change the meaning of that word in that language. That's the that's the lack of control feature. Now, okay, so remember we were earlier talking about the difference between the externalist and the internalist. Here it looks like maybe the internalist has a much better uh, game going on so that the internalist could say, well, you know, that's, that's your problem, externalist. You've this crazy theory about meaning determination being historical and sociological and inscrutable. I, on the other hand, the internalist, I have this 
beautiful idea that it all depends on me. That's how I can just change me. That was the direction you were suggesting the internalists go in. And that's fine. That is a way to start thinking about it. What I say in the book, well, first of all, I'm not an internalist. This is not my direction. People have written a whole bunch of papers now trying to develop a version of the view that you're mentioning. I think it's important for someone who wants to go this way to notice a couple of things, okay? The first is making something dependent on something internal to you. That doesn't give you control. Tons of things are internal to me that I have no control over whatsoever. I mean, the stuff that goes on inside my eyes and my ears right now, there's, a, there's a so much of it. And most of my cognitive life, I have no control whatsoever. And the elements of control we think we have are often illusionary. You know. So it's so very difficult to locate the source of control, even inside. It might be just as out of control. Yeah. And that's going to depend on a bunch of assumptions that you make about your internal cognitive and emotional lives. And, so on. and even if you found something that you had control over, you'd have to make sure that that thing was the meaning determining factor. And then there's another more technical thing that we could talk more about if you wanted to. Like, even if you had found the thing that philosophers sometimes call the supervenience space inside of you, and even if you had control over that supervenience space, it isn't clear that you have control of the supervenience relation. So how to get from that base that you have control over to the meaning, that could be like a really weird relation. It doesn't have to be some obvious, simple step from the thing you have control over, the thing that meaning supervenes on, on the internalist view, to meanings. It could be a mess. But anyway, that's all uh, for the internalist to work out. So, but back to the big picture. Uh, then my externalism is uh, depressing for those people who want to be philosophical activists. And so in the book, I say a bunch of like slightly provocative and annoying things uh, that annoy people who want to be uh, philosophical activists. At least in this domain, I, I feel like it's not going to work very well which is very sad and disappointing for those people, but not sad or disappointing if you come into the discipline with my expectations. Good, yeah. Um, one thing that comes to mind is, I mean, there's definitely a distinction between, say, the meaning of a term in English, which is going to be something, I mean, fixed by, um, well, at least a great number of agents, perhaps many that are... Um, in the past and some causal chain perhaps something to do with that but more than just one agent speaking at a time um at the very least but you might think that how an individual uses the term they might decide to use it in a, a new way right I, I don't know that's i guess that's sort of what i had in mind discussing um uh how i might adopt a new use of the term woman for example i might just start using it in that way I, and frankly i've i've found myself doing this in the past not necessarily with that term but with other terms um where i just change how i use it i'm not saying that that has broader semantic influences but unless i'm wrong about what's been going on i, I think that's something i've done i, I don't know what, what do you think about, about that? i i think you can do all kinds of things yes but it doesn't change the meaning of the word unless you have a peculiar or particular me theory of what it is for that word to have that meaning. Now, you could, be, you could be doing something else, okay? So people have been writing really interesting papers lately about how just speaker meaning can be changed by you individually. So sometimes uh, there's a, people draw a distinction between the semantic content or the meaning a word has in the language and the meaning it has for the speaker. And the speaker meaning might be easier to change in that, in that way. Now, remember, I was setting out the goal of the conceptual engineer as uh, changing the meaning of the word in the language. And you might think that's the wrong way to describe it. The goal should be the more modest one of 
changing you as a speaker, your meaning, or you and some friends, and that would be good enough. Maybe the goal that I've been describing is uh, too ambitious. Maybe the lack of control feature shows that it's too ambitious. And so what we should be doing is is something more modest and, and less wide reaching. I mean, I'm not, I, I'm not, I'm not very, I don't feel great about your, pro, your, your modest project because look, you really want to use this term, right? To talk to other people and they don't know that you have this weird habit. And so if they're going to tell other people what you said, it depends on them doing this weird explanation knowing and remembering all that, you know, that unusual part of you. So we have conversations that they usually go really fast, right? And our memory and the cognitive work that we can put into conversations that, or understanding of particular works, words isn't massive. And it relies on a kind of automati automaticity that we want there to be and uniformity. And so even though the thing you describe isn't impossible it it sort of creates a little bottleneck that's going to make people annoyed and it's going to undermine certain kinds of things it's it's a bit similar to our guy and this has come up quite a bit in recent discussions of these issues take a uh, typical theoretical let's focus on philosophy since we're talking about philosophy philosophical works very often you will see that in the beginning the writer will say something like, by, by freedom, I will mean, and then they give a definition. So that's a, that's a little bit like what you were describing. They'll just make a stipulative definition at the beginning of the book in, or the paper and say that they're using that word with, and then there's some very specific meaning. And so, uh, for example, look, I'm going to give you an example. So this is a new project I'm working on, on uh, political terminology, and in particular, the concept of democracy. So the concept of democracy is interesting because it's such, uh, first of all, it's incredibly important. It has all kinds of practical implications, but it's also a complete, total mess and incomprehensible, inconsistent, incoherent idea. But lots of, often you will have theorists who are aware of that mess say, yeah, but by... If you look, for example, at the Stanford Encyclopedia entry on democracy, um, Tom Cristiano and co-author will start by saying, well, by democracy, we will mean, and then they give a definition. Not, none of you will, no one will ever come up with that definition for ordinary speakers of English. And it's not a match with any other theorists ever. Written. It's completely, you know, but it's pretty cool. It's interesting. Someone could use the word democracy with that meaning. And that's what they do in the paper. Now, one thing I do in the new book is I show just how difficult it is to stick to that, even in your own paper, and how hard it is for other people to understand it, and to have conversations going, and to answer previous questions, to quote previous people. It creates this massive complication. So, Possible, of course, to do what you were describing. People often do it. Uh, this example of democracy is, a, you know, it's a great illustration. Almost everyone's doing something along those lines, but it creates difficulty. Yeah, yeah, fair enough. I guess I see that. I mean, one one kind of example for me that that came to mind was um, how I was how I was using the term atheist. Um, at one point, I, I I would use it just as the um, description of a person that lacks a belief in God, and there were some people yet that used it that way, and, and I still are. And then I tended to use it in a more at one point I started to use it in a more um, normal philosophical sense for as a, 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 a for a person that denies that there's uh, any gods. Um, and I don't know. I just I, I never found myself changing how how I use the term. Um, although both uses uh, are, are present, the term is sort of polysemous in that way. Um, that shift seemed um, sensible and, and not so problematic um, for me to, to do. I, I don't know, that's just one case. 
Um, that made sense for me. Um, well, well, I mean, take that case. So, the, <laughs> one of the topics that I touch on a lot in in fixing language, and also in the new book on this, is things that aren't maybe so deeply philosophical because they're, I mean, they're kind of obvious. It's and it's illustrated by your case. It's that. Those kinds of switches back and forth very often tend to create communicative difficulties. Now that's not a, yeah, doesn't mean it's not doable. It just creates this problem. Like you, you know, yesterday you meant one thing, today you mean another thing. This person you're talking to doesn't know which one it is. And then she'll say something and you don't know which one she means. And there are five other things it could mean. So that's just what we generally classify as verbal disputes. You think, well, sometimes verbal disputes don't make any difference. Who cares? We can talk past each other. I'm a little bit skeptical of that. I, I actually think verbal disputes really matter often, and we should pay more closer attention to it. But it creates those, those kinds of uh, um, communicative difficulties. And, and now I'm going a little bit beyond what I said in, in fixing language. Uh, and I'm talking about the, this new, new book where I'm, I'm very focused on the sorts of situations that you just described and the problems that I raised for it, how easy it is to do better. So remember when I started describing the project of conceptual engineering, it was this normative project of assessing what was there and then second stage of normativity, how can we make it better? And I think the, the situations that you were just describing and indefinitely many similar to it, it's really simple to avoid the difficulties of, for example, verbal disputes. I mean, we do it theoretically in writing by subscripts or stars, or we put little symbols to track the different meanings. But in English, we have, you just did it. You just added a few words. You said, lacking a belief, believing not, as the contrast, right? And so it only took like a few words to avoid that problem. And so here's a way we could think, well, if you wanted to potentially avoid those confusions, you could do better. And that's that, that project of trying to do better uh, is something that I, I didn't talk so much about in fixing language, but I'm sort of picking up in more recent work. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Fair, fair enough. Um, yeah. So I wanted to cover a few other things here. Um, you've sort of touched on this um, already, but um, one distinction you bring up in the book is between um, what you call the metasemantic base and the metasemantic superstructure. So the base consists of the facts which go into grounding or determining meaning and reference. And the superstructure consists of facts about, well, I mean, it's our various attitudes, um, beliefs, and so on about, about meaning and reference. Um, and so you argue that conceptual engineering really requires changes to the base, um, not the superstructure. I mean, our beliefs and attitudes might change. Um, so long as those don't involve some change to the, the base, the facts which actually determine the meaning and reference, then, well, affecting the the attitudes has little effect on, on the meaning. Um, I guess, could you expand a bit on this distinction and, and why it's relevant to your theorizing about conceptual engineering? Yeah, I'm kind of stealing in probably a very annoying way for Marxist, some Marxist uh, terminology. And it's to highlight this, some features of what we've already talked a bit about. If the meaning determining facts on the view that I favor are outside of our control, it's not about my beliefs, my attitudes, my intentions, my preferences, maybe none of our preferences, or being this broader group of, of the linguistic community. We could we could all want a word to mean something, but it doesn't necessarily mean it happens. The, the meaning determining facts are complicated 
and not determined by what I or anyone else wants it. So as soon as you see that, then there is this interesting gulf between what we want words to be, or more generally in this case, how we think language ought to be and how it actually is. And so just getting people to have the correct beliefs or the correct preferences will not suffice to get you to the right normative point. So suppose you're, I mean, the, I, I know no one really thinks this, but there might be this, you know, when they think about it, but there's this maybe naive hope that if I could just convince everyone, you know, so their beliefs were such that the things that ought to be the case ought to be the case. Like that's a, This word ought to mean P, and now I just convince everyone that that's true. And then you think, hey, that's work is done. Everyone has the right beliefs. Then we're done. This is awesome. All I need to do is give a bunch of arguments. It would give so much power to philosophy. If we have these knockdown great arguments and like it kills everyone, then the world would just change. Well, it won't. You can have everyone have these beliefs and it makes no difference at all. We can make it worse. So so there's very little so on this picture, there's very little correlation between the superstructure getting people to think or say or hope or whatever it is goes on in their head and the actual reality of, of linguistic uh, meaning, semantics, and the things that drive genuine linguistic change. There might be, just to get clear, it's this is not the view that the attitudes that people have, their normative views that they are irrelevant. It's just that the mapping between that and, re and the sem underlying semantic reality could be incredibly complicated. Uh, there's no simple step from what a lot of people want to it actually being like that. And the things that you need to change are, are very, very different from changing people's minds. So the, the, I mean, let's just think about all the different ways in which language is used. Billions of people, there billions, endlessly many speech acts every day all over the world over a very long period of time. And we don't understand how, based on that whole pattern of use, a word in that language gets its meaning. It's maybe just, in my view, probably too complicated for stupid creatures like us. It's an incredibly complicated thing. Like, what's not going to be the case is that getting a bunch of people to believe something suffices for getting what they believe to be the case. That's the, that's the point of that distinction. Just to highlight that. Yeah, good. Um, so something, something I was thinking about related to this, um, and this might just come back to how we're thinking about meaning and reference and, and I don't want to necessarily dwell on that, but um, when I think of what the meaning of a term is, say, in English, well, that's, I would understand there's a fact about how um, speakers of the language tend to use that term, I suppose. Um, so the sort of individual utterances, and there's what people mean on the occasion when they make those utterances. And what they mean might be determined by broader facts, maybe some historical facts and so on. But it's it's the individual facts concerning, you know, token utterances and the meanings associated with them that go into the meaning of the term in English, say. Um, I mean, is, broadly, does that, make, does that um, sound right to you? Or do you think that kind of gets the order wrong, really? You start... There's a fact about the meaning of the term in English, and then. Okay. Well, I don't think it's that easy to. So, yeah, I don't like that way of describing it. Um, well, let me just sketch this very simple Kripkean picture for you. So, so Kripke had this theory that it is genuinely is very simple and barely a theory, as he grouts a term is introduced at some point. He calls it a dubbing. doesn't matter if it's an actual dubbing or just some introductory event. And then it, he, he, he says it's passed along as if in a chain 
They can go over many hundreds of years. Say the term gold or cup or torture. I think it can be any kind of category, really. Um, for each chain, you know, piece of the chain, which will be different speech acts by different people, uh, they will denote, they will talk about the thing that it was used to and talk about as an introductory event. Sort of its anchoring point. Now, this is incredibly simplistic, but just run with that simple picture for a moment. And then the sort of stuff that goes on inside the heads of each little element of the chain, billions and billions of those little things in the chain, that really doesn't matter much at all. It's its connectivity tracing back to the anchoring point that's doing the overall work. And yeah, I could have all kinds of confused, silly ideas in my head without I use the word cop. On some occasion, I might think giraffes. I might think inflation. I might, you know, just like all kinds of totally off things. But it really doesn't matter because I'm part of this chain where cop traces back to an anchoring point, picks out a certain kind of thing. And so, yeah, I'm not, so it's not a picture where what goes on inside the heads and the beliefs and the meanings really uh, makes, makes that much of a difference. Now, of course, the picture I just drew for you is, is very coarse, um, but I like a, a version of that and the sort of down place what goes on inside every moment. There's a, just an elaboration on that a little bit, which is that the, the thing that you think of as what you meant, I think is very often also understood solely in terms of its historical, social, causal interconnectedness to other things. Yes. Because one of the things I really do mean, just to go back to this weird case where I was by cup meaning giraffe or something, one of the things I really do want cup to mean is cup. So the, this is one of those weird sentences where, now I want the word cup to mean cup. That's definitely off, right? I'm not, I'm never denying that. So, um, at least I take it not in the cases you were imagining. So, so there also I just the second cup is really that public cup, you know. So, it, so it's not as if just looking inside the head is going to get you away from this external language element that's still in there, and you're still parasitic on it, even when you try to tease out the things that's supposed to be the the meaning in the head independently of the social historical context. I don't think you can find that very easily. But again, we're, yeah, we're moving back to these debates about the nature of externalism and internalism. So I just want to remind uh, those listening that you know, I am really not writing. I wasn't writing a book that was supposed to exclude that. So I was uh, actually writing a book that was supposed to encourage people to do that. And one of the, you know, to plug in their own favorite theories. And one of the things we've seen the last uh, few years is a really amazing, impressive work of people who have tried to articulate conceptual engineering from the kind of perspective that you're, you know, gesturing towards. And on those views, the, the thing that I say about lack of control seems um, like a form of hyperbole. There's, there's a, definitely some control and that control is connected to an important notion of meaning and yeah the little sketch that I just gave you of why I think it doesn't work that's not sufficiently sophisticated to refute it so there's a big debate to be had and the thing that's exciting about the field of conceptual engineering is how it's been able to incorporate all those different perspectives and people just use it independently of the kind of view that I was suggesting. I think people really read the book you know, and other books in a very sort of free-spirited way. They, were, they said, yeah, I don't really like that part of his book, but I like the general idea, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to try to play around with that way of thinking, that more normative perspective, and just you know, forget about that stupid externalism that Kaplan cares about. I like this theory, and then they went along and did some, some really interesting things. I, I think if people will care about this book in a few years at all, it'll be 
just you know a lot because of that because they feel like it's something that you know the like plug and play structure. I think look just this one thing. One thing I think is just the fact that this issue of being in control or not being in control has become salient. That to me is really important. I is a great topic to be thinking about. Just you know, I remember when I started talking about it. I said you think philosophy is this incredibly deep, incredibly important. Some of the most amazing achievements of humans have come through through that work, but it doesn't have much effect. I said, look, I, if that's not true, if it does have effect, you know, I mean, if we can instantiate that in this particular with this particular case, that's amazing. Be great if I was wrong about that. So I'm really happy that people are thinking about that topic. I mean, the the big issue is like too big to talk about, but these particular cases, like in the case of conceptual engineering, is a way of instantiating and making concrete and, and maybe really even acting on on these issues. I mean, there's just we haven't talked so much about any particular case yet. And, uh, you know, just so, so audiences listening to this can can get a feel for how strongly people feel about these issues. Uh, just think about gender pronouns right now. I mean, it's, it's definitely a category of linguistic expressions that is in a certain, has a certain kind of evolutionary moment where the way in which they're used, first of all, involves a criticism of previous use and proposals for how it should be used and potentially massive sanctions for people who don't use it the right way. So we're, for certain expressions, we're like in the middle of a very, you know, politically charged, emotionally charged, morally charged period of reflection. So it is, so it's, so for, to say just the sort of my attitude, well, we can't really do anything. It doesn't matter. That will, to many people, that will seem really uh, nonchalant and lack of engagement and so on. So, so people who feel strongly will, will really want it to have more, more of a direct political effect. Yeah. Uh, yeah, that's, a, that's, that's, that's good. Um, I did want to uh, cover a few other things from the book um, before we kind of uh, finish up. So, and another kind of big issue that that I found interesting was um, what the uh, limits of revision are. Where some change ceases to be revision and is just some sort of topic change. Um, you're talking about something else rather than um, talking about the same thing, but perhaps the 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 use or the um, the concept, if you prefer, has has, has shifted. Um, so, I mean, I guess do you mind just talking briefly on on um, how you think of uh, that distinction and what we can sort of say about that. I make a big point of this in the book, and, I, and before I say more about the problem, let me just say. A lot of the reaction to the book is that I make too much of a, po of a point out of this and that we really shouldn't worry so much about it. And I'm, I'm open to that idea. But let me tell you what I think. The worry is the worry goes back to at least one reading of an exchange between Strawson and Carnap. And Carnap, I remember I said Carnap was suggesting that we make these concepts from ordinary language more precise so that we could theorize about them, explicating them, we called it. And Strawson said, famously said, well, if you do that, let's say with the concept love, to some more precise, scientifically specifiable concept, you're just not talking about love anymore. You're just talking about something else. You've lost the connection to the thing we were talking about. And then structurally, that seems like a pretty... <laughs> possible view. You have a term in the language that has a meaning, 
at one time, and then later, 10 years later, say, it has a new meaning. So now it just looks like you're talking about a new thing, because it picks out new things. How many you just, you change the meaning, isn't it just like using bank for first for the financial institutions and then for the river, the, the thing along the rivers, that's just not the same thing just because we have the same word. So that's the worry. The worry is that when you change meanings, like I've been talking about, you're just changing the subject matter, changing the topic, talking about something else, and you can't answer the question that people were asking before. There's a breach in the continuity of inquiry because you've changed the meaning. It will always generate verbal disputes. It's just a mess. You shouldn't be doing this. You should have stability of meaning over time. Otherwise, it's a disaster. That's the worry. And one of the main goals of the book is to look at different ways to articulate that worry. Just different ways of saying it, and then to provide a, an answer. So, so instead of saying more precisely what the worry is right now, let me just gesture at what I think the beginning of an answer is. I don't have a full answer to how to deal with this. The initial step in seeing how to answer this is to notice that we, as a matter of fact, don't worry about, forget about meaning change generated by conceptual engineering. Just think about ordinary language meaning. It changes all the time. That's also a fairly indisputable fact. There's this great paper by Kian Dorr and John Hawthorne. And in that paper, they talk about the term salad. And they observe that in the 1930s, I don't know exactly, you know, about 100 years ago, you'd have to be predominantly leaf-based in order to be a salad. It couldn't just be fruit. I, I'm not totally sure if this is true, but so, but that seems plausible. At that time, fruit salad wasn't salad. It'd have to have a large amount of leaves in order to count as a salad. Okay. Then over time, our language expanded the notion of salad little by little. And we now allow for all kinds of things that aren't predominantly leaf-based to be salads. Now, an interesting fact about this evolution, let's just, for the sake of argument, say that it is a fact and that it's not very unusual. A fact about it is that we're not, thinking that the people in the past talked about something else. We still say they were talking about salad. You know, if I want to describe some people in a restaurant in the 1930s, it's like, well, she ordered a salad. He had a salad. She said to him, I have a salad. We would report them as having used uh, the word salad. We would use our term salad to say what they said. Okay, so these facts about ordinary reporting practices is what I use to say, look, it's not a fundamental problem, this meaning change problem, because we're already familiar with it. We know we have some of already built that into our ordinary linguistic practices. And then the hard part is to create a theoretical framework for how to incorporate that uh, into a theory of conceptual engineering. And I have some proposals for how to do that. But it starts with that observation about ordinary language and how we re react to gradual meaning change and say, well, we just don't react the way Strawson predicted, where, where we just say, hey, you are just talking about something else. She didn't order a salad. We don't do that. We have this smooth way of dealing with it. And the challenging part is to figure out how to create a theoretical framework for describing that. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I mean the broad pressure, that, that seems quite right to me. I mean, um, if we... <laughs> If for every little change um, there was in, in how a term was being used, say, we said, oh, that's just something completely different. Um, I mean, we'd be doing that all the time, right? Because there's, there's little changes all the time, um, many of which we're not even sensitive to. Um, so as, as a matter of fact, we don't. Um, but then what, what, 
how that works, like what sort of the boundaries are, can be a bit vague and and tricky. But um, it feels like to me um, that in some way what the boundaries are is going to be determined by I don't know, like certain conventions that we have. Um, I, I don't know. Like I was thinking at one point you brought up this comparison to the case of well, what if the, the number one uh, or, you know, we revised that to be 1.00001 or whatever. And like, well, okay, that might come in as a topic change um, because in that case, um, the boundaries of the topic for like the number one are extremely narrow. So something that's quite mathematically precise. Um, but in other cases, and that's something determined by our, our, our the conventions we have there or how we're using that term. But in other cases, it might not be super precise where um, there can be changes, um, quite significant changes, say in the salad case, um, which as our conventions go, or we counted still as, uh, on the same topic, if that makes sense. I don't know if you would sign off on much of what I said there, but does that make a whole lot of sense? Or? No, no, no that, that, that sounds like is definitely uh, along the right lines. You know, people have theories about conventions and there's a whole framework from Lewis for thinking about conventions. I'm not sure I'd buy into any particular version of that, but but some sort of general sense that this is in part conventional. Yeah, that seems right. Um, the reason we wouldn't be happy with changing the meaning of 1 to 1.0001 is it would have these massive, complicated consequences for how people do mathematics and calculations and make payments and it would make a mess out of our banking system we would have a collapse it was just have these massively negative or messy consequences that would require a lot of work we're not willing to do it so that's why we're not doing that we wouldn't consider that an okay change but the thing with salad including a little bit more potatoes maybe a little apple at the beginning that, that and a nut that was like yeah who cares? It doesn't matter really. Nothing's going to fall apart. The banking system will collapse. We're just going to have like, some more yummy uh, side dishes. Um, so my own sense of this is very, very unsatisfying. Like I don't have a good theory. And, I mean, I don't have a good theory or something. I usually create a theory that I call the no theory theory, which is just an excuse for not having a theory. And so that's the theory that you can't have a theory of it. Uh, no, there is. So then you need to answer, well, why can't you have a theory? Well, because it's up for negotiation, it isn't predetermined by conventions or anything. So, for example, is it determined whether waterboarding should be torture or not? Is it, is it, is that, would that still, you know, if we exclude it or include it, whatever, is that still count? Well, it's in part a matter of simple power games, social interactions determine which one wins out. I don't know. And who's going to win the power match? Like the, you know, when are the practical consequences going to be such that the one side wins and the other one loses? I don't have a theory of that. And I doubt that there can be a philosophical theory of how those kinds of negotiations should be run or who's going to win them that we can predict so if it's if it's a kind of negotiated settlement involving you know, unpredictable actors and different social sociological psychological factors it just feels like the kind of thing that we philosophers wouldn't be in a very good position to say oh here are the necessary and sufficient conditions for that to happen it's got this more chaotic element to it but I, again, someone has a much better theory than that. I'm super happy. I'd be happy to see it. Yeah, yeah, it seems like room for for development there for sure. Uh, I was wondering what you think of of the following sort of case where concerning topic change, because um, you know, if this is all kind of there's a fair amount of dynamic um, aspects to this um, up for negoti negotiation then and the following seems like it should be possible. Um, so at one time, the limits, you could have some term or concept um, 
the uh, limits of revision would prevent a certain change from being, well, uh, just a mere revision, it would be a, a topic change. So say um, the change from C1 to C2, that would be a topic change given the sort of limits at one time. But then the limits of revision might change and at some later time, that same sort of change from C1 to C2 would count as just a re revision and not a topic change. Um, I don't know if I said that super clearly, but but then the the, the, the question is that suppose that change then took place, um, C1 was devised to C2, um, would it count as a topic change or, or not? Because like on the sort of initial conventions, it wouldn't. And then there's some later, there's some conventions according to which it would. Um, you see what I'm getting at there? I don't know if those. I mean, I think that you're pointing to an interesting fact, which is that relative to something, call it a context or a set of conventions or what have you, some relevant unit, relative to one unit, it can be topic continuity. Relative to another, it isn't. And now, if those, now the question is, how do you adjudicate the output? The one context from the second. That's a interesting philosophical puzzle. And it looks like, and it looks like it pushes us a little bit in the direction of some form of relativism. So we're sort of in this the kinds of issues that sometimes racist worries about relativism. So it looks like from the C two, the context two point of view, it's true that it was topic continuity. From C1, it's not true. And now we, standing outside all of that, want to say, well, which one is it really? That there's a form of contextualism that says, well, it's not difficult at all. It's just, it's true relative to C1, but it's not true relative to C2. Or the other way around, I don't remember how I did it. But you just sort of relativize all claims about topic continuity to the relevant standard contexts, agents, settings, whatever. Uh, or you say, this is the more radical, there isn't, it's, you know, it's just like from C2, it's just monadically true that it's topic continuous. And from C1, it's monadically true, that non-relativized true, that it's not topic continuous. And then you have this worry, well, how can they both be right? That looks like some dangerous form of, uh, of relativism. So I'm, I'm of the, I like the first view where you contextualize it, where you just say, well, all these claims should be understood as tied to a particular context or a set of conventions or something like that, because otherwise things are going to get too messy. In general, I am, uh, and this is not about you know, this doesn't spring out of this particular set of considerations or this book. This is the end of the work, but it's helpful here. I think that what someone said and whether two people said the same thing depends on the interpreter. So I hold the view according to which meaning is interpreter dependent. And that also means that another interpreter can say that they said, can truly say that they said something else, something other than what I think they said. So I can say, well, they both said that there's a cup on the table. That guy, relative to him, it could be true to say, well, they didn't say that they both said that there was a cup on the table. So I want to relativize the truth about all sayings and same sayings to interpreters. So no absolute objective truth about it other than the objective truths relativized to interpreters. Okay, that was a big uh, assumption there, but it's there's separate arguments for that that we haven't talked about. So I, do, I feel very comfortable about that, but I guess people will find it weird. No, that's, that's good, and I, I really like um, your thought about, well, I mean, here's how I might put it. If, if um, the facts concerning whether a change is uh, topic continuous or or, or, top, or topic change are determined by, well, I don't know, facts about certain conventions or contexts. 
and those might change over time, then uh, talk of whether it's topic continuous is going to have to be fixed to some set of those facts at some time or context or convention. And it's just going to be relativized or, or contextual in that way. I mean, it's just it's going to follow. Um, maybe. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. That's the picture. Yeah. Um, so w- one more thing that really um, stood out to me in this book is where you sort of argue that there's potentially worldly effects of, of conceptual engineering. Um, we aren't always just merely changing our represent- representational devices. In some way, we're changing the world. Um, and I, I, maybe you could talk briefly about this because, um, well, to me, oh, I mean, our, our representational devices might change. Um, but that's clearly something in the world that, that changes. Um, and what things in the world lie in the extension of some term or concept that we have might change, you know, the sort of collection of fruits might not count as a salad at one time, but count as a salad at another. Um, I mean, is that, is that the extent of, of the worldly change or is there something, um, more there? How how do you talk about that? Okay. Let me take a new example to illustrate this. Uh, I think it's easier. It makes it a little bit more vivid. Let's think about the notion of a family. And so let's, I think this is probably true. There was a period, maybe not all that long ago, where sort of um, biological offspring connection or blood connections of some kind was more closely tied to the notion of what kind of as your family. And then now the notion of a family is extended to include many other kinds of things. It looks like several ways to describe that. The word family has changed its meaning over the last, say, 100 years. Now, what counted as a, didn't, wouldn't count as a mother in the past, counts as a mother, or what counts as your family has changed. That seems to be a claim only about the word. That doesn't sound very interesting. I mean, it has interesting features for people who are interested in words. It could be about concepts, but I don't know what concepts are anyways, and I don't appeal to them. So for me, that's not a useful option. Um, But here's an interesting question. Can we, and this is really all I have in mind, can we also say that what a family is has changed over the last 100 years? So notice that in that question, the word family wasn't in quotation mark or anything like that. I'm just asking straightforwardly, is what a, what a family is, has it changed? Has the nature of families changed? And I think the answer is yes. And I give a theory for why we can say the answer is yes. What a family is has changed over the last 100 years. Assuming all that background story that I just started with. And that claim about the change in a family is a claim about the world. It's not about a concept. It's not about a word, not about a sequence of letters. It's about families, and they're changing over time. Now, this could all sound kind of spooky. Like, how did we create this new change in social structures by changing the meaning of a word? Well, clearly we didn't. I mean, those things were already there. What has what has changed is a change, broadly speaking, of the con we've been talking about, where I mean, a word has changed its meaning over time. But what is interesting, supposed to be interesting about this, is that that change allows us to say things like families have changed. That is, to make claims not just about the English language or Norwegian or French or Italian, but to talk about families. That, that's a, I think that's interesting. But we know what the facts are. There's no spooky intervention in social structures from the linguists or from the philosophers. The facts are, as, as everyone knows, but I think it's important that these changes can be described at an object level, namely families have changed. 
I think you can push me on why is that important, but that is a, at least an initial interesting observation that it's, on my view at least, going to end up being true to say what families are has changed. Yeah. yeah I mean, I guess when I think about the statement, um, families have changed or what families are have changed, um, it's not super clear to me. Like, I could think of, say, like a particular family as some token family, um, or maybe more precisely, let's say something that counted as a family um, at some time, as we were using the term. Um, perhaps at at some later time that, that that didn't count as a family. Is that a family changing, or is it just the nature of family changing? You know, I guess I'm not hard to put this into words, but I guess my concern is I'm not really clear on what the what is being changed and when we say that families change i don't know if that's clear there is that i mean it's, it's not like I'm, i think this way yeah no i think that i you're right to be puzzled by this so of course i what i i don't mean that some people died and some people were born and so the actual families there are have changed because of just ordinary uh sh 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 death and birth they the thing that has changed to start describing is that what it takes to be a member of some particular individual's family the conditions under which you stand in the same family relationship has changed but what i just said is going to sound unsophisticated to a certain kind of philosopher they would want to say look you shouldn't say that what you should say is that there is this word in English, family, and it's the meaning of that word that has changed. And of course, that's how you and I have been talking for the last hour and a half or whatever about words. But I, I, and the argument is too complicated to go through in detail here. I just, there, there is a way of saying that, which has a simple form. The nature of families or what families are has changed over time. Now, the reason why I think that's important is that that tells you a bit about how to interpret those kinds of claims about the nature of social structures, the nature of social organizations when we talk about it. The way we talk about that is connected to these linguistic and conceptual issues in interesting ways. So you can read something back into the conceptual engineering literature that it's interesting from the point of view of the conceptual engineer when you see things like social structures changing over time so it's supposed to create a connection between the linguistic work and the sociological historical real world work so it's not as if we're just fiddling with words just thinking about how to change the meaning of same sequences and letters but we are actually tracking real phenomena in the world. That's the worldly interpretation of conceptual engineering. Of course, you cannot interpret that in the crazy way, whereas the people who do conceptual engineering, we sit here and we like restructure social reality. But there is a, dis so that, because we're not, so that would be crazy. But what the result of our work is, can be described as uh, a change in, or the proposal that the nature of families change. I should say this is this is subtle stuff that that you know when you do, it should be downplayed a lot because obviously we're not you know restructuring social reality, but um, at the same time it's very important to keep this in mind because otherwise I think the whole project that we've been talking about can look trivial, pointless and uh, insignificant because all we do is play around with the meaning of some sequences of letters and if someone told you that that was the essence of philosophy that that was an important core element of philosophy uh, you'd be surprised like who cares what those letters mean that just seems like a trivial issue well this worldly dimension should make it less so i mean there are other replies to that objection too but this is part of it I have a colleague here in uh, Hong Kong, Max Deutsch, 
and uh, he's he's written this really great paper called Fiddling with Words, where he raises this objection to conceptual engineering. Uh, so, if you want to see the worry that this is in part of Clyde, uh, take a look at his paper. Yeah, yeah, I'll have to check that out. Um, not familiar. Yeah. Um, so I did want to wrap up in a few minutes. I don't want to don't want to keep you uh, all day, but um, I think you had mentioned uh, in passing that you have in the works a, a new book, uh, somewhat related on on political concepts. I don't know. Do you want to talk briefly about what your project is there and what we can expect uh, from that? Sure, I can just sketch quickly. So I have this uh, fantasy or plan. I don't know how best to describe it long term to write a trilogy so one book is about fixing language the new book that i just finished is about abandoning language and you should just get rid of it and a third book is about creating language so fixing abandoning creating uh, so the abandonment book is not about how to take some existing linguistic fragment criticize it and make it better it's about taking some linguistic fragment, finding it so deficient that it should be abandoned, and then thinking about the consequences of doing that. So, in the cases we've been talking about, family, torture, person, salad, they're all terms that we keep that can be disagreed with or what it should be, how to use it, so on. Atheism, that was your example. Uh, do you want to use it in one way and in another way, and so on. Um, but one option when you think through this critical, go through this critical phase is you might think, look, that piece of terminology is so awful. Let's just get rid of it. Now we're already familiar with this. <laughs> Slurs of various kinds, pejoratives. Uh, I guess a standard view is those should be abandoned in the sense no one should use them. So you have newspapers like the New York Times where you can't even quote the N-word because even in quotation marks, it's not, so they don't even, it's not just like it shouldn't work, it shouldn't even exist, instantiated. That's a crazy, bizarre view because it's inconsistent, but put that aside, like, they, it's a fair thing to think we yeah, completely eliminate its use, at least outside quotation marks. Now, maybe there's a uh, extended, maybe this can be extended to other things. And so the book starts by thinking through how in science, for example, lots of terminology have been abandoned over time. Medicine was dominated by terminology used to describe the humors. Uh, no one's using that terminology anymore. I think for those who are atheists, there's a bunch of religious terminology that's just used in a straightforward way by religious people, but theists that um, the atheists wouldn't be using. And as a matter of fact, just their linguistic practice would sort of radically change when moving from being a theist to an atheist. Just parts of language is just falling out. As I want to think generally about the conditions under which you abandon language and then the consequences of doing it. So that's the first part of the book. And then I do something that I didn't do in the first book. In, the, in fixing language, I didn't really discuss any particular case in detail. I didn't really endorse any particular amelioration. I just talked about this general structure. But then this book is, is just devoted to a particular case study of uh, the Church of Democracy and the way in which it's used in political discourse. Uh, and it's at least exploring the view that that term is so deficient that it shouldn't be used, that we can do better than that. And that for political, intellectual, and any kind of serious work, we would be better off using other kinds of terminology. So it's a way of instantiating in a very vivid way this strategy of abandonment. Uh, but, but in this case, to really go into very great detail about how a particular term has been used, all its semantics and tactic features and so on, and what the alternatives would be. Yeah. Um, to me, I'll have to 
uh, uh, check that out when it, um, you know, hopefully when you, when you get to that. Um, yeah, so I do, I do like to, um, end, end these interviews with a general kind of meta, meta philosophical question. Um, so I was wondering what you think is the, well, the value of philosophy. Why, why is, why is philosophy, uh, I suppose worth doing for you? Um, but, and perhaps more broadly for, um, society and, and, uh, intellectual life. Yeah. I'm, I'm a super optimist about philosophy. I, uh, am always baffled by all of my colleagues who, who spend their life doing philosophy and then as philosophers spend a lot of time trash talking philosophy and it's, uh, various defects and inferiority to the sciences and so on. Uh, I, I think of philosophy as the foundation of all other intellectual inquiry. So I have a very old fashioned view, I guess. I think no matter what you're thinking about, special sciences, ordinary life, religion, anything, you name it, you're just like two or three questions away from philosophy. And for the most part, the people who are non philosophers are making assumptions of a philosophical nature. Their entire thinking, their conceptual frameworks, and their worldviews rest on philosophy. And we philosophers are privileged and lucky to be able to spend our life thinking about the foundations of what everyone else is doing. That, to me, is one of the most exciting ways that you can spend your time. And I feel incredibly lucky being able to have it as a job. I had a, a professor when I was young, his name was Arne Ness, he was a Norwegian philosopher. He used to describe philosophy uh, as follows. He said, philosophy relates to all other intellectual activity, like champagne to root beer. And that's, that's my view. Now, a lot of the pessimists about philosophy uh, have arguments. So they will write books or papers talking about how philosophy is making no progress, how there's irresolvable disputes and so on in philosophy, and that that reflects poorly on the discipline. I, I think exactly the opposite. I think we're making massive progress. We've solved almost all the big problems of philosophy, and we're answering more and more of those questions, uh, asking better questions. Um, so my view is we're, we're making more progress than most of the other, than the scientific disciplines, for example. And the disagreements we have are, are an asset. I have this picture where collectively we've solved the problems. I li like to think of it as we're a group of people who are looking for, let's say, a gold coin. And there might be a few thousand people out there looking. And if one person has found the gold coin, then we've found it. And so all it takes is that one of us, the group of philosophers as a whole, has found the right theory. And if you take all the core questions in, in metaphysics, philosophy of mind, philosophy of language, moral philosophy, and so on, where we've become incredibly good at covering logical space with possible positions, and people have developed really good arguments for almost all the positions in logical space. And so I think it's reasonable to assume that one of those positions in each of those domains is the right one. And so we have found the answers because one of us have. Now, the weird part is we can't really say and reach consensus on who has found the correct answer. But I think that's a good thing. That just reflects something about the nature of philosophical inquiry because Philosophical inquiry is so much about methodology and about starting points that are absolutely fundamental that you you will find people who have different methodologies and who have different starting points who inevitably will reach different conclusions. And it's going to be incredibly hard to convince them because we don't have, uh, so to speak, evidence-neutral data to appeal to. We're at such a fundamental level that when you encounter people with different fundamental assumptions, 
it's going to be really hard to to convince them. But that's that's part of the structure of philosophy. So that's the nature of the enterprise. We shouldn't expect something. The only way to achieve consensus in philosophy is to force people or to just like just hire people who agree with each other all over the world, make sure that people have the same starting point, which would be horribly coercive. Philosophy is wonderful in its pluralism, and it's part because of that pluralism that we've been able to cover all of logical space. And then there are some lucky ones in there who found the truth. And by virtue of their finding the truth, we have found the truth about all these difficult questions. It's just that given the kind of open, pluralistic discipline we are, it's going to be very hard to get consensus on who they are. But that doesn't mean we haven't found the answer. Fair enough. I, I, I'm not sure everyone shares quite that optimistic view, but um, I guess I'm on, mostly on board there anyway. Um, yeah. Um, great. I did, I did want to I think and the and the questions there has been um I don't I don't want to add uh kind of off topic that the the title of this channel uh friction is in a way kind of relevant to the the topic of the interview today um because it was inspired by a passage from passage from Wittgenstein um where he considers you know a case where a language is our language is in conflict with our requirement for it uh so we need friction Back to the rough ground. Um, it's inspired from that. Uh, I, you know, I just thought that was interesting because it's relevant. But, um, but yeah, anyways, <laughs> thanks. Um, thanks so much for, for coming on today and um, writing this book and, and taking my questions and, uh, and uh, giving me a thoughtful response. It's been great having you. Oh, thanks for talking to me. That was uh, really, that was great. Thanks. <laughs>